Welcome back to Dan on Dev. Today we are finalizing the Why All Application Security Products Suck series with our uh, episode here on the experts. Uh, and I'm joined today by Michael Farnham, a good buddy of mine. I'm bringing him in because he comes from the, well, in one of his roles, he came from the Static Analysis Society. He was with Fortify. And so I thought his perspective would be really useful here. The, the goal of this and the goal of bringing the experts is to bring in different point of views. So that's what I'm trying to do with Michael, what I've been doing with the other experts, what I did on each series, uh, each product as I covered each product. The goal here is to give you information to help you make better decisions. The more that you understand how these things are built and how things happen, uh, what works and what doesn't, the better informed you are to pick the right solutions for your problem. So that's the goal here. If this has been useful to you, please hit the like, subscribe, uh, make you know, give me a comment. Let me know what you're thinking. I would love to answer any questions that you might have. We're going to be continuing into out of this series now, and we're going to still be talking about application security, but I'm also going to be incorporating in more about software development leadership because uh, the better engineered software, the the leadership matters in that conversation. So we're going to be talking a lot about that space. So uh, for now, we're going to be joined with Michael Farnham on the other end of this intro. All right, we are here now with Michael Farnham. He is a longtime buddy of mine and a podcaster. I've we actually had a show together. I kind of like snuck my way in. <laughs> to the cast at some point. I was a guest initially and then I became a regular. Uh, I'm bringing Farnham in in particular and I'll let you introduce yourself in a second, but I just want to kind of set up the premise. I'm bringing uh, Michael in here because he worked at a SaaS company. And uh, so on the AppSec side, he understands what it's actually like being on that side of things. So I thought his perspective would be helpful and uh, we can call BS on, on things or, or validate things and then we can just kind of get into it. But Michael, I'll let you introduce yourself. Take it away. Hey, thanks for having me, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So like Dan said, Michael Farnham, uh, Currently, these days, I am advisory CISO for Trace3. Uh, previously with Set Solutions, I was the CTO over there. We got uh, acquired by Trace3 not too long ago. Um, also co-founder of uh, HUSECCON, Houston Security Conference down here that Dan spoke at. He spoke at a couple of times. Uh, been in this field, I don't know, 20, well, since 1994 is when I got into the field, way, way back when. Um, so, but like Dan said, yeah, I worked at Fortify for uh, I don't know, almost four years. And uh, it, Fortify started as a SaaS, but when they got bought by HP, they also bought, um, was it Spy Dynamics back in the day? So they had a, uh, app, uh, a DAST, and they had, I think, maybe the original, original RASP. Uh, that came out way back in the day that used the old um, agent that they had, and they kind of repurposed that for RASP. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not 100% sure if it was the first one, but I know it was one of the first ones, and we used to do that, and partnered with an SCA, so they never had an SCA. So I've, I've seen all the tools, sold all the tools. Um, probably the only one I haven't really sold is uh, I asked. Um, and, uh, yeah, if, if we go down that modern list of yours that's probably the only one i haven't done so so that, thanks for and yes we did have the the podcast back in the day an information security place podcast you and jim and me um and yes your web app minutes we always joke turn into 15 20 would take the whole damn show excuse my friend um but it, it was fun we had a great time with that and actually it was i wasn't in AppSec back then so uh, i learned a whole lot from those um from those sessions. So really appreciate all that uh, wisdom you brought back in the day. You know, I kind of forgot about that, that you weren't really AppSec. So now I can, I can take credit for the whole career that you've moved into. <laughs> I'll send you uh, part of my salary from now on. <laughs> so yeah, this, this industry has evolved quite a bit and some of those debates spawned the next generation of product. And I think we're kind of getting to that point too, where I think there's going to be uh, another set of next gen 
solutions. I think a lot of the the current categories are pretty ripe for disruption. So I think that's gonna it's gonna be interesting. I think over the next couple of years. I think a lot of them, like SaaS, will absolutely always be there in some way, shape, or form. I mean, even with the modern companies, they're you look at what they've got on their product list and there's a SaaS on there. So they haven't got away from that completely. I think a lot of what uh, you're seeing is a modernization of the ability to integrate into the pipeline where they can help the devs. I mean, if, dare I say shift left. I remember when we first started using that term, but you're just seeing a modernization of, of that side of things. You're seeing a focus on more modern languages and frameworks in the SaaS space. I think you talked about in your uh, in your why AppSec sucks or the tools suck is that you either had a focus on fewer languages and frameworks or you had a broader, a broader breadth, but you didn't go as deep. And I, I remember being at Fortify, we would always have this race with Veracode, who was our primary competitor back then. And it would always be who supports what language. And you'd have a salesperson hitting us up going, hey, we need to have support for this framework or this language immediately because my customers got that. And we would throw it out there and you know, you'd know you have about two inches of depth on what you could detect or anything that you could detect. It was, it was really kind of horrible. And I would, as I was practice principal and I was having to go out and enable SEs and go, oh, we have this support now. And it was just horrible support and it just didn't do anything, but you had it and Verico didn't have it. It's on, it, on its list. And then the next week it would show up on their website and it was just kind of a joke, right? So, um, so I do see focus. I do see modernization. I see a lot of the um, the infrastructure as code stuff coming out now, where you know, all your Terraform scripts and everything else is getting thrown in there, so you can see if there's any flaws there. That's a whole category we didn't think we had to worry about back in the day when we were throwing this on a you know physical web server in our data center. So. I think that's where I see the modernization. I don't know how many, if they're gonna create new categories. I mean, I think SCA is as close as you can get to a new category, even though it's been around a long time, but how they're modernizing, how it can do more automated pull of library libraries and that kind of stuff for developers. I think the focus in my mind is all about making all of this more dev friendly and helping them, again, I. I've always had an, a problem with shift left from the perspective of where people say it's you're shifting responsibility to the developer. Who is responsible for this? It was Darwin. What? It was her that flooded the place. I thought you were going to take the rat. Anyway, it was clearly mom's fault. She was the one who left Gumball in charge. Well, it, it's dad's fault for not finding a proper babysitter. Well... None of this would have happened if it wasn't for you. you. You can't do that. You still have to have a security team that helps you know, focus on that and finds the problems and helps the tooling and all of that stuff. But it absolutely has to be developer friendly. It, you know, it can't be just, oh, we have an IDE plugin and you're good to go. No, I think it's fair. And I think some of the categories will stay the same, but they may shift a little bit in their, their proposition. So you have companies like... Uh, Bright Security, and they're doing a, <clears throat> a DAS solution, but they are focused on like what they call their developer DAS, and so it's it's really designed to do these little micro scans uh, yeah. right where you're working on the code, right? And so I think there'll be more and more of that sort of thing where it's it's using some of the DAS principles, right? Where it's it's attacking the running application, but it's it's targeting a little tiny piece. Or and you mentioned the cloud side. You know, uh, infrastructure is code now, right? And uh, as you move to that, there's a security implication, and it's more than just policy, right? A lot of the the cloud security uh, tools are focused on the policies, and those are important and critical to get right. And you don't want to have like an open S3 bucket and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to understand how these pieces are all communicating with each other and and have least privilege applied at that level, but it's you're still going to end up at some point putting code onto these different pieces that's custom code right yep. and and the ability to connect the dots between the code and the service that's running there's going to be a combination of SAS, SCA 
uh, all of that that's going to come together along with the kind of the cloud security profiling that will all merge at some point to give you a better picture. I think that's, I mean, that's where things have to go to start solving some of those problems. Or, I hate saying solving because <laughs> none <laughs> of these actually solve the problem yeah. to, to help yeah. with the problem is you're going to yeah. need a merger of these things. So I do think there may be new categories that, ta that are the combined yeah. solutions. Um, and, and again, I hesitate even going back to the beginning of, of what you're talking about with the, the SAST and having the breadth versus depth, right? Uh, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I, I said that actually several times. I used it in a few different episodes. Anytime I see a vendor that is saying they solve all of these things, yeah. I basically, one, you don't solve anything. You're helping, right? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, you're providing some tooling. Nobody's solving. This is a nuanced problem. But the more that you say you have a ton of stuff that you can do, the the less I trust any of it, because you're going to have to do everything at a at a two inch deep level. So when I, I remember in the beginning, you know, the, some of these SaaS vendors had four or five languages they supported, and and they did them really well. And I remember even check marks, I think it was. They initially had a, a pretty small list of languages when they first came out, and they. They bragged about how deep they did each one of those. They were focused on it. And then they got into the race. <laughs> and they started adding a bunch of languages really quickly. And like, oh, yeah, we, we, we leveraged all of our existing like understanding of language constructs. Like, no, you didn't. No. It's, you can't. It's just not how it works. And uh, that's not to say they did a bad job or Fortify or you know, Vericode that they, they, they weren't trying to do their best and they don't, they don't try. It's just the practical reality, you know. You have like time versus you know, time. Ver time is the limiter to this problem, and and everybody has a limited time and resources to apply to each thing. And if you say you solve all of it, you're you're probably solving it two inches deep. I think the way you said that. Yeah, I mean, you've got a marketing department for one, and and you know, not talking bad about marketers. I've been in marketing before. Um, I'm actively involved <laughs> I mean it, it was technical marketing let me uh, clarify no I'm um, kidding I, kidding. I, had, I, I was I participated in marketing myself so yeah all we all do these things, <laughs> yes. right? especially the roles we've been in you, you kind of have to um, but at the same time we I think I, I know how well let me back up. I know how hard that job is to market and what is your job your job is to get eyeballs on your product and so you have to say certain things and you've been taught to say certain things to get people in. Uh, it is what it is. I mean, I, I think if you've been in this field or any field for more than five minutes, you know you're getting marketed to, you know there's a con constant stream of crap that's just coming at you. You learn to discern. And that's why like the Gartners and the Foresters and that stuff were created in any of those analytic firms. But you talk about the, of course, you know, there's we can get into a whole world of and hold another session about those things, but um, it, it's still there. And then when you've got the salespeople uh, that need, when you because what happens invariably, you've got a. If you're not a modern company that was created in the last two years, then you've probably got 15 different development people or 15, you know, 50 developers, and they're all developing in a different language and are, are at least using a different framework in the same language and you have to worry about all of those and your sales guy trying to sell something, your salesperson trying to sell something and they go, oh, I need this framework or I need this framework and you go, well, I don't have support for that so I'm gonna go to your competitor and see if they do and they, they're dang sure gonna go build it uh, so you've gotta do the same thing. So yeah, you get into the arms race like you said. And it was always frustrating because as a practice principle, when I was at Fortify, it would be the same thing. I would constantly have this barrage of salespeople. And it, and I actually, I was thinking about this this morning, us coming in you know, today, what we were going to talk about. And it, it's just, it goes back to what kind of one of the things you said of develop in, in your session, developers being, or development being an art, not a science in a lot of ways. And when you've got an art inside of a new language or framework coming out every 20 minutes, and then you've got a 
new developer who gets excited, and rightly so, and I'm glad they get excited about writing in this new framework, writing this new language, because it does some stuff that the other one didn't. And now you, as a SaaS uh, product manager, have to figure out how to support that. And figure, I mean, it's just a never-ending stream of just stuff that you never can't support at all. And, and I think the dream is from a product company or from a product management perspective is if you've got a new company that just started and they've got one language and then you can go into depth on that. But it's just from a business perspective, you know, you limit your addressable market to this. All of that weighs in and it, I know it becomes frustrating for people, but it's the reality of the situation and it's why you get so much dilution in all of these tools and limited support and I don't know. We could preach about this forever. Yeah. No, you know, you brought up two, the thing, two things that stuck out is the these uh, the point solutions, going to the, the most recent point here, the point solutions that are coming out, they add, they add also a ton of complexity to the shift left model because you're you're building out these DevOps models, right? And so you've got the you know operations folks that have to kind of get the get these things installed at, at certain points, and mm -hmm. and the more point solutions you have to have. So let's say you've got a, you know half your team uses Java, and so you're going to go find the best Java tool, and then the other half over here is using I don't know, Go. Well, mm -hmm. and then you go find the, a Go scanner. Now you have to build out support for operating both of these things and that just adds a ton of complexity and if you add a third and a fourth now your ops people are going to force you to use a, a, a product that does all of them at, at two inches deep right mm -hmm. and so there's just it's it's a difficult problem and it's it's interesting trade-offs and i'm not sure what we do about it the uh, the other point that you had mentioned is that the sales folks will often drive the product feature set and and that is just a practical reality when you're building software that you're going to be selling you're building at this this tool that you're going to be selling the sales team and even the marketing team to some extent because it's like oh our, uh, vendor x over here that we're competing with they just announced this feature and and either your sales folks or your marketing folks or you know the, the product research team whatever they're all going to force you to, to add to check the box yeah. and and gartner is going to do the same thing when they put out their report they're going to you know, drive this new, this is what everybody's doing. And now you have to follow the crowd. And so there's, it's, it's interesting challenge. So, and, and that's, you know, I didn't talk about any of this, like the business side of, of security products. You know, I didn't really get into in the series, but this is fantastic. This is why I wanted to have this, you know, have the, the other experts in to bring these perspectives. Uh, Cause that is a part of the challenge. It, it really is. I mean, and again, it's a, there's no companies out there that do anything exactly the same. They're all selling one thing. They may be selling the same kind of widget, but they're selling it in different ways. And that means you need to do different things for your development to make those things happen. It, it was, I mean, you've, I know you've seen it, but working as a SaaS guy, I mean, DAST is not as difficult, right? Because you can just go after stuff. You don't have to worry so much about that. But on the SaaS side, it was... It was a constant stream. It really was. And and when you don't have support for something, and, and as a person with a, this is going to sound bad because I don't mean to imply that salespeople don't have consciousness, but as a, but they're just trying to sell stuff, right? That's their livelihood. And me trying to support them and trying to support the SEs, and then knowing that we literally launched support for this language last week, and it's probably got three indications in there that might be worth something that you know and, and you're going to potentially go into a customer and go we support this now and they may have all kinds of different problems in that language that are just kind of inherent to how people write in that particular language and they haven't been taught as to write better because it's a brand new language even though some of those things all apply for all languages generally it's still maybe they haven't been taught as well there and you've only got three or four things that you can detect in that code that might be a problem, but there could be, 50, but now you give a false sense of security potentially, and and they may not care. Maybe it's just a checkbox, like kind of what you said about laugh, you know, it's kind of a checkbox for PCI, it's the same thing. Could it just be a checkbox, whatever. Um, but it's, it's still scary as me trying to say, as a security professional, I want to make sure 
that my customer's code is secure and that everything is secure. Again, I'm not going to solve it, but, and I don't think that's idealistic, right? I think it's just what we're trying to do as security professionals. And you don't want to give your customer a false sense of security. And what if they do get popped and you didn't have enough support in that language, even though you said you support it, what happens then? And then all the T's and C's come into the contract that they sign. And all that business side of it. I, I had to sign so many contracts, but I think I'm scared that's still going to come back and bite me one day. Yeah, that, this is great. And this is fun getting into the business side of it. The uh, And you mentioned that DAST is easy. And it used to be, it was never easy, but it used to be easier. And it used to be, we didn't care what was happening behind the scenes because all we're dealing with is the HTML side of things. Yeah. But over the last five years with the how thick the clients have gotten, yeah. and now it's like, you know, massive client side code. So DAS has gotten considerably harder and to a large extent it has to be rethought. We were in the middle, we've been in the middle of rethinking it uh, at Rapid7 with the App Spider product and mm. redesigning the whole premise of the crawling because it it's changed so dramatically so quickly that, you know, we had 15 years of it. We added new uh, data formats but the client side just completely, you know, like Ajax came around and then all of a sudden it just exploded in the single page apps and, and then single page apps with numerous frameworks. So the client side, the DAS scanning has gotten uh, complicated. We, we basically have to support all these different frameworks and mm -hmm. how the, you know, some of a lot of the nuances of the frameworks. And so that's a good point. I mean, it's almost like you're back to fat client days, right? So, yeah, I mean, you, you thought everything was supposed to be thinned out by the, the web app or by the browser. And now there's so much on the other side to enable so much. I mean, I, well, even client, I mean, it's become that so far that um, like the PCI is starting to address the client side problems on apps now with the mage card attacks and that kind of thing. You need to make sure that that side is secured as well. And that's, I think that's coming out in the new version where they're focusing more on the client side, which I was actually happy to see. But of course, the other thing, talk about marketing, what it did is create a rash of companies that now do client side checking for application security and that's all they do and it's it's kind of an interesting dynamic to see these things get created these whole product categories get created but one of the things you brought up too before on the product category side um, you know, we don't have a category for it but I think who are we going to look for to create a category is probably Gartner, right? And, the, and you've seen that in different product spaces. But like even an example of that is you had web application firewalls and then you have API protection, like, you know, the salts and no names and all that stuff. And now that's come together into a category. You've already seen that blending in the uh, WAP, W-A-A-P in Gartner. And I know all of this sadly because this is my life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then in other categories, you see the same thing, right? Like outside the AppSec space, it used to be endpoint and whatever. Now it's EDR and those things are starting to merge. Same, same stuff in this space. So I do agree with you. And I, I liked your point earlier that you're going to see all that kind of blend. And it, it'll be interesting to see, talking about the marketing side, how, how product companies put it together within their marketing because it'll be essentially I used to think about it from an Aperva standpoint they were the only ones that would give you from all the way from the um, the web application firewall all you know from, from the web app itself all the way into the database so you could kind of see that stream from start to finish now it's all runtime but you could see it from start to finish and that's what I kind of see is that somebody's going to have, they're going to blend all of that. Um, and a lot of that is, has to be SAS and SCA based. I mean, you have to be able to scan the code. You have to know what the libraries are, what everything that they're using, that are, all the components that are putting it together. I see that in companies, what, like uh, Sneak and Phylum and I think White Source on now Mend and other ones like that. Uh, right. those are all starting to be kind of that modern stuff that, and there's a ton of them. It's, it's starting to be a little bit of a knife fight out there. Which one do you use? 
Um, and then they're all starting to come together with um, more DevOpsy companies that didn't have the security side of things. Um, I always thought API tools should get all API security tools should get bought by like a mule mule or soft or something like that, you know, with their API gateways, but that hasn't happened yet. So I'm wondering, that's what I see as even the next iteration, maybe as some of those DevOps companies. Portals. Well, as, as you get more of the like thick client, almost it's like, uh, you know, Chrome OS, right? Like it, the, the whole Chrome OS model was like, everything's going to live inside the browser. And so you don't need a, a traditional desktop environment. And everybody kind of, myself included, dismissed that. But, geez, that's become the world. You know, we're even sitting here recording on Riverside, which is a, a web app, um, which is bananas. So it's well, it, it's Bill, crazy Bill how far. Gates, Bill Gates, to be fair, sorry to interrupt you. Bill Gates, to be fair, saw this in, what, like Windows 95, where he changed the mouse pointer to a, a finger. He saw this. The guy's brilliant. Just yeah. Saying. <laughs> and actually, in his book, he talked about it too. I think it, that uh, book he had done back in the late nineties. The the so yeah, this is all moving to just all living in the browser. So you have a combination as you move forward of these of code that you have to write that runs on the back end, and then there's a bunch of client side code, and you have APIs, and they're going to come in a bunch of different flavors, but the APIs themselves add their own ton of complexity. I am thankful for like GraphQL, just kind of touching on this for a second, because it brings back what SOAP had. This is again where Microsoft was ahead of the time. SOAP had a WSDL, so you had a document definition. When we moved to REST, it was like, oh, we just want to be, you know, we don't want to be, have to like have a document. That's, we want to be loosey goosey. And that just has been a disaster yeah. because now these APIs are not documented in a programmable, usable fashion. You get a Word doc half the time. So, uh, it's so they, you know adding you know we're talking about um, uh, MuleSoft these companies and and was it Bear or something they put out the you know the Swagger and now Open yeah. API and all this stuff has come out they they're trying to fix it but at least GraphQL has the introspection built in so it goes back to having like a Wizdle did uh, so I'm kind of thankful but it also oh. the 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 nature of the graph points. Oh, <laughs> oh! It's not. It's it, yeah. And I'm not a developer, right? Not by trade. I, I've, I've had to learn all this stuff and really dig into it and learn. And when I started looking at GraphQL, I, I started reading up on it. It was like, oh my gosh, okay, yeah, the documentation is nice, but good gracious, alive! I mean, can we just go back to Swagger? Because when we were doing Swagger stuff, at, and I know there's stuff that helps, but. It, 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 the other thing that got me about GraphQL too, um, with the, talking going back to the API security tools, is that was a big feature in their products was to automatically document for you. So developers didn't have to document it; it would go in there and create a document for you. You could, you know, swizzle it and figure it, but it would, it would create a lot of that documentation stuff for you. That's going to be. I still think that's going to be around a while because people are still going to use it. GraphQL is not like taking over the world magically, but. Um, but yeah, I, the first time I looked at it, I was in, um, oh shoot, I don't remember what class I was in and we were, we were playing around with it and I, I had not even, I had heard of it, but not had looked at it at all. And it was just like, oh my gosh, this thing is crazy complicated. It, it, it can get very complicated, you know, coming in from a developer side and, and yeah. building out our GraphQL support for the scanner, it mm -hmm. can get complex because now what I like is it's kind of pushed rest further on using open API yeah. and, and then adding support for links. And now, you know, as more, more people use links in, uh, in open API that, that establishes a relationship between certain calls, right? But it doesn't have the nuance and detail that GraphQL can provide. So, yeah. but GraphQL can also be a little bit overblown because it has like every relationship between every object. And so you get these like, spider web looking relationship structures that I'm not always a fan of because it's like, it's too much, but it comes down yeah. to how you work with it though. Right. I mean, if you, you can keep it organized and not get completely nuts, but it's still that art versus science. Cause somebody gets in there and just has a ton of fun with it. And then you create some massive, how the hell do you even interpret what's going on in here? Um, yeah. It can be really frustrating, but yeah, I'm sure I would not want to be in your shoes having to write scanner for that damn thing. 
Right. Yeah, and uh, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how these companies do it. And I'm, you know, being outside of Rapid7 now and kind of just sitting down and looking at all of these different product categories again and, and talking with, with some of the companies starting new, mm-hmm. some of the founders starting new security companies, it's going to be interesting. I'm excited. Uh, you know, I know, I know we're, like some of this conversation is the negative, uh, the problems with these products. But I think if, if everybody's open-eyed about what it is, also be open-eyed about what they do do there are a lot of good there's a lot of value in these products there's a lot that they help you with it but you do have to understand what they're good and bad at otherwise if you go you know you'll get plenty of the good when you talk to the sales and marketing side right they will tell you all of the things that it does and 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 a lot of that could be true-ish but um, (laughs) but you also kind of you have to understand it completely and have open eyes as you go into each of these products so uh I know we've kind of gone a little bit long, but anything else you want to throw out there? Any other, uh, any on, on any of the categories or uh, just overall thoughts about AppSec? I mean, in general, no. I, I think I I agree with you on the path. Um, I, I do think it's all got to come together. I, I do think what you will get is a resistance in some ways to some of the coming together. Um, my thing is there has to be, to your point on not being negative, What what we've always a lot of times I've had in the past is an application security people going, these developers are writing all this crap code. Developers going, AppSec is just getting in my way and the ops people just sitting in the middle kind of laughing at the whole thing. Um, And what I do like as a path and I see it more and more, at least externally, I'm not sitting in a dev shop at an AppSec, but what I've kind of wanted to start focusing on a little bit and um, some of what I've been trying to talk about is building like a security champions program within these organizations. Because I, I remember way back in the day, I had a customer, the first time I ever sold a web application firewall, and they had a de- somebody from their development team who had a security kind of a mindset come over to the develop or to the application security team and help the security team interpret what was coming out of the WAF and really help them fix stuff. And that was the first example of ever saw that like a security it was like almost like a backwards security champion but um i think we need to get more and more of that where the development teams and it's not just all on development but development teams that use there have somebody and recognize somebody that is a application security mindset as well as development get them touting you know a championing and the security side of things if you build more of that out, then you're going to start getting cooperation between the two, whereas traditionally it's been hard to get that. Um, and and what I've seen, especially on the cloud side, and this will be kind of my last point so we can quit recording here, but what you started to get, and I made this point on one of the Cyber Sundays that I did one time, is you get shadow security because you start getting s- – development people and operations people that have been taught that you have to have security, you have to have security, you have to have security. And they go, okay, but my security team's not doing anything to help me with this, or they're just sending me a pile of vulnerabilities that I've got to go fix. So I'm going to go start doing some of this myself. And they do those things, and all of a sudden you got security pop-up that's not adhering to any policies or whatever. And so you don't get shadow IT, you get shadow security, which actually may not be good. So... I say all this is you really need to get cooperation between those teams. If you don't have that, you're gonna, you're just gonna have problems over and over again. And it doesn't matter how many tools you put in place, um, you're just never gonna get anything done. So I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, but I, it's still a problem today, and it's it's frustrating because you know I started that preaching that story back in 2014, and I still see it as a massive amount of problems even today, almost 10 years later. It's very frustrating. So. Yeah, and I, I was there with you, man. I, I will say I've also appreciated that we've made some progress. We used to be it used to be really intense between developers and and security because all of the security teams would deliver a dev a, a security report to the developers, yeah. and it was like you knew you have to prioritize these things. And I started advocating, man. I think my first slide at a conference, I, I was looking at some. I was going through my old conferences. I had a conference talk in 2005 where I said, no, a bug is a bug is a bug, yeah. right? Like it doesn't matter. It's just a security, it's just, it's a security or it's a feature bug. It's a bug. 
and developers are comfortable with bugs. So you can report a bug to them. And I've definitely seen a, a vast improvement of not delivering security reports, but now all of a sudden we're shoving stuff into their Jira tickets or whatever, right? Yep. And and so that's a little safer of a conversation. Now what we've done is is uh, waterfall a whole bunch of results <laughs> into their Jira <laughs> you know, that they're not all entirely happy about. But it's moving in the right direction ever so slowly. And and the more we're shifting left, not as you said, it's not about shifting responsibility left. Uh, I think, I don't know if we were talking about that before we recorded, yeah. but you had said, I don't like shifting responsibility left. That's fantastic. But shifting the tools to deliver data left so that yeah. they, they, they're they they're getting more contextualized data, that's that's critical. And, and we're moving there. It's just at, at moments, it feels like if I look over the lifespan, it could feel glacially slow, but we are moving in that direction. So uh, no. I'm, I'm happy with that. I, I agree. I, I don't want to leave it at a negative note. I have seen a lot of progress, even in some of my customers. I've seen a lot of a lot of good progress there. Um, I'd always like it to move faster, but uh, hey, progress is progress. I'll take it. Okay. Well, man, I appreciate you joining to uh, just help me have more of this conversation about uh, why all AppSec products suck. I think I'm going to actually title this at this episode with all their experts why all appsec experts suck and uh, so i thank you for helping me uh kick this series off hey don't don't blame that title on me <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun well at least that was a lot of fun for me hopefully it was useful to you it was a good conversation i really appreciate michael joining me on the show and giving me his insights and his thoughts always super helpful so if this was helpful, it was helpful to me. Hopefully it was helpful to you. And if it was, please click the like, subscribe, send me a comment. Um, but until next time, this was Dan on Dev. <laughs>